Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're starting a more detailed general chemistry playlist. If you've been following me here for a while, you know I already have a general chemistry 1 and general chemistry 2 playlist. However, I've learned a lot in the past two years that I've been doing YouTube and I have a lot of new ideas for how I want to teach general chemistry. So here in this new playlist, we're going to go into more detailed discussions about every topic, and I plan on incorporating a lot more practice problems as well, both in the lecture and in separate videos that are going to follow every lecture video. So we're going to go ahead and start with chapter one. It's titled Chemical Foundations, and the objectives that we want to cover in this playlist are as follows. First, we're going to start with a brief overview. So for a long time, humans have believed that matter is composed of atoms, and in the previous three centuries, we've collected a lot of evidence to support this belief. So here, the goal is really to get you excited about chemistry by describing how recent technology allows us to quote-unquote see individual atoms and how chemistry is in everything we see and do. And in discussing the importance of chemistry, we're going to move into the second objective, where we're going to talk about the scientific method. Third, we're going to move into a discussion on measurement. Here we're going to talk about base versus derived units. And in addition, we're going to discuss how units are modified through the use of metric prefixes. We're going to learn that measurements also have some degree of uncertainty, and that's the topic of objective four. We're going to learn also how to distinguish between accuracy and precision. With all of this background, then, we move into talking about significant figures in Objective 5. We will cover rules for counting significant figures, rules for significant figures in mathematical operations, and rules for rounding. Our sixth objective is on dimensional analysis. This is the most important topic in the first chapter. If there is any topic that I would recommend focusing on the most, it is gonna be dimensional analysis. Please make sure that you fully understand this topic because it is a reoccurring theme in general chemistry one and two. Dimensional analysis is a problem solving technique that's used in chemistry to convert between different units of measurements. It also involves using conversion factors which are ratios that relate different units to cancel out unwanted units and ensure that the final answer has the desired units you're looking for. Then the next two topics are gonna to be temperature and density. These are also important topics that will reemerge and we'll rediscuss throughout our general chemistry course. Density is going to be defined as mass over volume and temperature here we're gonna cover the different units of temperature we're gonna encounter in this course. That's gonna be Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin, and we're gonna learn how to convert between each of these units. And then last, but certainly not least, we're gonna talk about classification of matter. Matter exists in three phases, and it is composed of many levels of organization, and we're gonna get into all the details in this objective. With that being said, let's get started with objective one. We're going to start with a brief overview. Again, for a long time, humans have believed that matter is composed of atoms, and in the previous three centuries, we've collected evidence to support this belief. And it is in this invisible world of atoms that we find a lot of interesting information. And it is this invisible world of atoms that forms the foundation of chemistry and its countless applications in the world around us. Chemistry focuses on the composition and properties of matter, causing it to occupy a really central and critical position in science. The study of chemistry, it impacts virtually every field of science. A fundamental understanding of chemistry is going to be required for success in many fields, including biology, medicine, earth science, and many, many more. Now, a, an essential foundation of, of chemistry is going to involve grasping the fundamentals of atomic structure, which serves as a stepping stone to comprehending the complex nature of molecules and of compounds. And this fundamental knowledge, this foundational knowledge, 
really paves the way for exploring the dynamic interactions and chemical reactions and into delving into principles of chemical bonding, stoichiometry, and the mechanisms that really drive transformations at the molecular level. To further motivate chemistry, I really want to talk about two quick things. First, I want to talk about the power of quote-unquote seeing individual atoms. First, obviously we can't see atoms with the naked eye, but we can use something like a special microscope. This one's called scanning tunneling microscope that we're going to focus on. Now, we're not going to consider the details of its operation here, but scanning tunneling microscopy really allows researchers to map a conductive sample surface atom by atom with ultra high resolution. Essentially, the scanning tunneling microscope uses an electron current from a needle, from a tiny needle, you can see the tip right here, to probe the surface of a substance. It was developed in 1981, and it actually earned its inventors the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1986. Now, in addition to quote-unquote seeing the atoms in materials, we've learned how to isolate and view single atoms too. And so at this point, we're fairly sure that matter consists of individual atoms. But the nature of these atoms, it's really complex. And the components of atoms, they don't behave much like the objects we see in the world in our day-to-day -day experience. And one of the main jobs of uh, scientists is to delve into the macroscopic world, discover its parts, and then try to connect the microscopic with the macroscopic. Now, something else that I want to talk about to motivate chemistry is chemistry in art. The intersection of chemistry and art is is exemplified in the analytical techniques that allow us to probe the molecular and atomic composition of artistic materials. So for instance, polarized light microscopy has been a staple in the examination of pigments. Polarized light microscopy can differentiate pigment particles based on their optical properties, and that's typically influenced by the crystal structure and the interaction of light with the material. And Actually, by comparing the optical signatures of pigments from verified works of artists to those that are currently unattributed pieces, a polarized light microscope becomes a really pivotal tool in authenticating artwork and potentially linking unsigned or disputed works to specific artists. Regardless, all right, of these two examples, I, I hope that you have gotten excited about chemistry. And hopefully we can carry this excitement throughout the course and as we move into objective two. In objective two, we're gonna talk about the scientific method. And to motivate this objective, I wanna start by asking you a question. How do you tackle the problems that confront you in real life? So think about something basic like your trip to school. If you live in a city, traffic is undoubtedly a problem you confront daily. How do you decide the best way to drive to school? If you're new in town, you might grab a map or you might open your Google Maps app and look at the possible ways you can make the trip. Then, additionally, you might collect information from people who know the area about the advantages and disadvantages of certain routes. And then last but not least, you might try a couple of different routes yourselves yourself to see what falls best with your preferred criteria for a route from your home to school. And after a few experiments with the various possibilities, you're gonna select the best way. What you're doing in solving this everyday problem is actually applying the same processes that scientists do to study nature. The first thing you did was you collected information all right, you collected information and you made a prediction and then you tested it out. So you made some observations, you collected data, you made a prediction, so you formed a hypothesis, and then you did the experiments to test the prediction. Scientists call this process the scientific method. The scientific method is a rigorous protocol that guides researchers through the process of scientific inquiry. It is a cyclical and iterative process that involves 
several key steps that are described in this image right here. The steps are really designed to build on one another, forming this continuous loop of hypothesis, experiment, observation, and refinement. So let's go ahead and go over the different components of the scientific method. First and foremost, you wanna generate a testable question. Science begins with curiosity and questions. These questions arise from observations about the world. A good scientific question is one that can be tested through experiments. After you've formed a, and generated a testable question, you want to then gather data and resources. So before you even form a hypothesis, it's really important to go and gather existing information and resources that are related to the question. This helps to ensure that the hypothesis you develop is informed and grounded in current understanding. Then you can finally form a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is an educated guess or prediction that can be tested. It's usually a statement about the relationship between two or more variables. Then after you've formed a hypothesis, you can get out there and collect some data through experimentation. Through experimentation, scientists collect data that's either going to support or refute the hypothesis. And this step can involve quantitative measurements or it can um, involve qualitative observations. After you've collected data through experimentation and you've conducted your experiment more than once, you can then begin to analyze the data. So the data has to be analyzed to determine whether it supports the hypothesis. This is going to involve statistical analysis to discern patterns or relationships in the data. And after you've done that analysis, you can then begin to interpret your data. So the results are then have interpreted to, to draw conclusions. This step involves considering if the data aligns with the, hypo uh, the hypothesis or if the data suggests a different conclusion. Now, something that's important to talk about after this process is developing a theory or a model. So when a hypothesis is supported by a substantial amount of data and it withstands repeating testing, it may contribute to the development of a scientific theory or model that provides a conceptual framework for understanding. And at this point, it's going to be really important for us to make a distinction between what an observation is, what a theory is, and what a law is. So a theory, often called a model, is a set of tested hypotheses that give an overall explanation of some natural phenomena. It's really important to distinguish between observations and theories. An observation is something that is witnessed and it can be recorded. A theory is an interpretation, a possible explanation of why nature behaves in a particular way. Theories can change as more information becomes available, of course. Now, as scientists observe nature, they often see that, hey, the same observation, it applies to many different systems. And such generally observed behavior is then formulated into a statement that's called a law. All right. So for example, the observation that total mass of materials is not affected by chemical change in those materials, this is called the law of conservation of mass. It's seen when you talk about chemical reactions, and it's seen in other instances in, def in different fields as well, hence why it's called a law. All right. Let me reiterate now in a few points the difference between theory and law. A law summarizes what happens. A theory is an attempt to explain why it happens. So there's this distinction between what versus why when we discuss theory and law. With that, we can move into our third objective, which is titled units of measurement. Chemistry obviously involves experimentation and measurement. And in order to communicate those measurements, it's really important to pay close attention to the units that are being used to describe them. 
every measurement must be expressed in appropriate units. Now, the agreed upon unit system among scientists is the SI system, and it's based on the metric system. There are seven base units in the SI system. I have them listed here in this table. All other units that you might be thinking about or are familiar with are just derived units that are obtained by combining the SI base units. Let's go ahead and go over them. So the SI base unit for mass is the kilogram. It's abbreviated kg. The SI base unit for length is the meter. It's abbreviated lowercase m. The SI base unit for time is second. It's abbreviated lowercase s. The SI base unit for temperature is the Kelvin. It's abbreviated capital K. The SI base unit for electric current is the ampere. It's abbreviated capital A. The SI base unit for amount of substance is the mole. It's abbreviated MOL. And last but not least, the SI base unit for luminous intensity is the candela, and it's abbreviated CD. Now we can use SI units to obtain derived quantities like volume, density, electric charge, and many others. Volume is a good example, so let's focus on that. Volume is the amount of space that's occupied by an object, and its units are cubic meters. The formula for volume is length multiplied by width multiplied by height, and you would express length in units of meters, you would express width in units of meters, and you would also express height in units of meters. So what you really have here is meter times meter times meter, hence why the unit for volume is cubic meters in the SI system. Now, units, they're frequently modified through the use of metric prefixes. You can add these prefixes to make it more reasonable to refer to different values of length, mass, or time, depending on the system you're referring to. So for example, if you are discussing a human cell, you don't wanna say, hey, a human cell is anywhere between 0. 0.000001 and 0. 0.00001 meters, when you can instead say that a human cell is anywhere between one to 10 micrometers. Micro here is a metric prefix that's used to modify this quantity of length. And here you see a, a figure with the various prefixes and their values. You should accommodate yourself with these because they're really important for a lot of future calculations we may do in general chemistry. And as we do these problems, of course, we'll reference and remind ourselves what these metric prefixes reference. But really quickly, just a couple that are important. We have mega, it refers to 10 to the power 6, kilo, 10 to the power 3, milli, 10 to the minus 3, micro, 10 to the minus 6, and nano, 10 to the minus 9. All right, so this is familiar here. Micro now we know ref references 10 to the minus 6. So for example, when we say one micrometer, we are essentially saying one times 10 to the minus six meters. And we can also see that one times 10 to the minus six meter is equal to 0 0.000001 meters if we were to expand our scientific notation. All right, and just as a quick reminder of how scientific notation works, if you have this one times 10 to the minus six meter, this minus six tells you to move the decimal point six places down left. So here we have our invisible decimal. We would move this one, two, three, four, five, six units down to the left. We would fill these positions with zeros. And again, we can see why. 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters is equal to 0 0.000001 meters if we were to expand it away from scientific notation. Now, something else that we want to talk about in this objective is mass. Mass is a measure of the resistance of an object to a change in its state of motion. Mass is measured by the force necessary to give an object a certain acceleration. On Earth, we use the force that gravity exerts on an object to measure its mass, and we call this force the object's weight. 
Since weight is the response of mass to gravity, it varies with the strength of the gravitational field. So for example, your body mass is the same on Earth as it would be on the moon, but your weight would be much less on the moon than on Earth because of the moon's smaller gravitational field. With that, we can now move into objective four, which is a discussion on the uncertainty in measurement. Now, any measured quantity always contains some uncertainty, and we use significant figures to communicate the amount of uncertainty in a measurement. This uncertainty, it's, it's not a flaw, but a fundamental characteristic of any measurement process. The precision of the measuring device directly influences the uncertainty, and yes, more precise devices will reduce uncertainty, but you can never eliminate it entirely. Now, to understand this better, let's consider this burette. Burettes are used in titrations. They're filled up to this zero milliliter mark. And then when liquid is dispensed by opening the stopcock, the liquid moves down and it reads out the amount dispensed. What we notice in this burette is that the precision of the burette is to the nearest milliliter as indicated by the graduation on the side. So you can see this graduation reference is zero milliliter. This is one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. Now, if we go ahead and dispense some amount of liquid and try to read how much liquid was dispensed by looking at this close-up of the burette, we're going to be looking at the meniscus. This is the curved surface of the liquid in the burette. And here we can see it's somewhere between 16 and 17 milliliters of liquid that has been dispensed. Now, if we try to estimate the next decimal place, Right? We might describe the volume as, oh, it's about 16.4 milliliters that was dispensed. In this measurement, what that means is that there is an uncertainty here in the tenths place. And this becomes a really good time for us to define and distinguish between precision and accuracy. The term precision is used to describe how closely individual measurements agree with one another. This graduated burette is precise to the nearest milliliter, and there is uncertainty in the tenths place. Now, precision is not the same as accuracy. The term accuracy is how close measured values agree with the true or correct value. To designate the degree of precision, precision and the amount of uncertainty in a measurement, we have to express each measured value with the appropriate number of significant figures. Now we're gonna cover this in the next objective, but significant figures in a measurement are gonna include every digit we're certain of plus the first uncertain digit. So in our value 16.4, 16, the one and six are digits that we are certain of, and then the first uncertain digit, that's gonna be our 0.4. Hence, again, why we said in this measurement, there is uncertainty in the tenths place. Now, we can visualize precision versus accuracy in this figure. All right, this is like a target, and let's say that you're throwing darts at this target. If you throw a couple of darts and they give this distribution here, you notice that the darts are landing kind of close to the bullseye, so they're accurate because they're close to the true value. Our true value is our bullseye. But you have darts in various different quadrants in this target. And so your dart throwing is accurate, but it's not precise. If we compare the second one, you notice that you're hitting really pretty much at the bullseye and every measurement is near the same area. So you're being both accurate and precise in your dart throwing at the target. This third figure shows a distribution that's not accurate or precise. It's nowhere near the bullseye and you have various darts landing in very different places. And so you can tell that there is not an agreement among the several darts that you've thrown in this figure. Here in this last one, you don't seem to be hitting the bullseye, so you're not accurate, but all your darts are landing in the same area. So you're precise, but not accurate. Another thing that's important for us to, to define really quickly is random versus systematic error. Random error, also known as indeterminate error, this is defined um, as when your measurement has an equal probability of being high 
or low. So this is the type of error that occurs in estimating the value of the last digit of a measurement. It has equal probability of being high or low. The second kind of error is systematic error, also known as determinant error. This type of error occurs in the same direction each time. It's either always high or always low. Now, we've made lots of mention of significant figures, so it's about time we move into the fifth objective where we talk about significant figures and calculations. Now, calculating the final result for an experiment, it usually involves adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing the results of various types of measurements. Since it's very important that the uncertainty in the final result is known exactly, we have developed rules for counting the significant figures in each number and for determining the correct number of significant figures in the final result. So first and foremost, we're going to cover rules for counting significant figures, and then we'll cover rules of significant figures in mathematical operations. For the rules for counting significant figures, the first rule is that non-zero integers always count as significant figures. So if you have a number like 15, this number has two significant figures. The one counts as a significant figure, and the five does as well, because they are both non-zero integers. The next three rules have to do with zeros. There are three classes of zeros. First, there are leading zeros. Leading zeros are zeros that precede all the non-zero digits. These do not count as significant figures. So in a number like 0 0.00025, this number only has two significant figures, that's going to be the 2 and the 5, but these leading zeros are not significant. The next class of zeros we have are captive zeros. These are zeros between non-zero digits, and they always count as significant figures. So if we have the number 1.008, this number has four significant figures, the 1 and the 8 and the two zeros that are captive between those one that between that one and eight. The last class of zeros that we want to talk about then is trailing zeros. Trailing zeros are zeros at the right end of the number. They are significant only if the number contains a decimal point. So if we look at a number like 100, just like this, this only has one significant figure. That's going to be that one right there. But if we have 100 and there's a decimal point very clearly demonstrated for us, then this number now has three significant figures. Those trailing zeros now count as significant because of the presence of the decimal point. And then the last rule for counting significant figures is exact numbers. So exact numbers, many times in calculations, um, calculations involve numbers that were not obtained using measuring devices, but that were determined by counting. Like you can count, you did 10 experiments. You have three apples. There's eight molecules. There's 10 books, etc. These numbers are called exact numbers, and they can be assumed to have an infinite number of significant figures. All right. And again, they are not going to technically affect a lot of the calculations. So they're assumed to have an infinite number of significant figures. Awesome. With the rules for counting significant figures, now we can confidently move to talking about rules for significant figures in mathematical applications and operations. We'll start first and foremost with talking about multiplication and division. For multiplication or division, the number of significant figures in the results is the same as the number in the least precise measurement used in the calculation. So, for instance, let's say you're multi multiplying 4.56 by 1.4. You put this into a calculator, the calculator spits out 6.38. That's not the end of the operation here. You have to correct this to have the num correct number of significant figures. To do that, you have to determine how many significant figures does 4.56 have? that would be three. And how many significant figures does 1.4 have? That would be two. Which one of these is the least precise measurement that's used in the calculation? That's going to be 1.4 with only two significant figures. And that means our final answer has to only have two significant figures. So in short, the product 
should only have two significant figures since 1.4 is our limiting term and it only has two significant figures. Then for addition and subtraction, the rule is that the result has the same number of decimal places as the least precise measurement used in the calculation. So for example, let's say that we're adding up the following numbers, 12.11 plus 18.0 plus 1.013. Plug that into a calculator, it spits out the following number, 31.123. Okay, now in trying to correct that value to have the appropriate number of significant figures, you're gonna have to look at each number and determine how many significant figures it has after the decimal place, the number of decimal places, all right? So 12.11 has two decimal places, 18.0 has one, and 1.013 has three, okay? Which is our limiting term. Our limiting term is 18.0. It has one decimal place. And so we correct 31.123 to be 31.1. The correct result is 31.1 since 18.0 has only one decimal place. The next thing we also want to talk about is rounding because you just saw me correct these two values and the way that it was done was through rounding. So let's also cover what the rules for rounding is so that we can properly express our final answers with the correct number of significant figures. The first and the most important rule for rounding is that in a series of calculations, carry all the extra digits through to the final answer, and then you round at the end, nowhere in between the calculations. Okay, the second rule is look at the digit that needs to be removed. If the digit to be removed is less than five, all right, then the preceding digit is going to stay the same. So looking at here, 31 point one two three we knew that we only want to keep one decimal point that means that the digit that we are going to remove is going to be this two right here first and foremost okay now if that digit is less than five which it is because two is less than five then the preceding digit this one that we're keeping stays the same this is why our final answer was written as 31.1 the second rule is if the digit to be removed is greater than or equal to, I should say, or equal to five, then the preceding digit increases by one. So when we're looking at our multiplication and division example problem, we said that the final answer needs to have only two significant figures, so the six and the three. The digit to be removed is eight. Eight is greater than five. That means that this preceding digit, this three, is increased by one. Hence why we wrote our final answer as 6.4. So those are, those are our rules for rounding. Now that we've covered all of this talk of significant figures, I'm gonna go ahead and just like scroll down here a little bit. And we're gonna do a couple of practice problems together to ensure that we really understand what's going on here. So this first problem says, Give the number of significant figures for each of the following results. A shows us a number 0 0.0105. Let's recall a couple of our rules, specifically for zeros. If you remember that the zeros to the left, all right, the zeros to the left of this first non-zero integer, these are called leading zeros. And we said that leading zeros are not significant. So we are not going to count this zero or this zero as a significant figure. However, this other zero right here, this is a captive zero. It's between two non-zero integers, one and five. That zero is significant. In addition, of course, non-zero integers are also significant. So one and five are significant, and so is that captive zero. This number has a total of three significant figures. This next number is 0 0.05000, wait, 0 0.050080. Okay, again, we have a couple of these leading zeros that we don't count as significant. Leading zeros are not significant. But what we notice is that we have these two captive zeros between five and eight. Those will count as significant. In addition, there is also some trailing zeros here. 
Now, this trailing zero is going to be significant because there is a presence of a decimal point. So now we can count up the total significant figures we have for this number. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five. This number has a total of five significant figures. Fantastic. Let's do this next example problem. It says carry out the following mathematical operations and give each result with a correct number of significant figures. The first problem we have is 1.05 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 6.135. Alrighty. So if you go ahead and you just plug those numbers into a calculator, your calculator is going to spit out a number that's like 1.7115 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, what is our rule for multiplication and division for significant figures? The num for multiplication or division, the number of significant figures in the result is the same as the number in the least precise measurement used in the calculation. So what we have to do is we have to go back and look at each of these individual numbers and decide how many significant figures they have. This number right here has one, two, three significant figures. And this number has one, two, three, four significant figures. The limiting term here is going to be this one where there's only three significant figures. So our final answer can only have three significant figures. That means that we're going to have to look at our answer and modify it. So if we look at our answer, one, two, three, those are our three significant figures that we're going to keep. That means that this digit right here is going to be removed. This digit is less than five, so our rule for rounding is that the preceding digit stays the same, and our final answer for this calculation is 1.71 times 10 to the minus, I wrote five, but it should be four here, I apologize. All right, it's times 10 to the minus four, so let me correct that for us. Regardless, the rules for what we just discussed stays the same, I just accidentally put four instead uh, five instead of four. Wonderful. Let's do the second calculation. The second calculation is 21 minus 13.8. Alrighty. If you plug this into a calculator, what you're going to get as an answer is 7.2. Now, this is a subtraction. So what are our rules for significant figures for addition or subtraction? It was that the result has the same number of decimal places as the least precise measurement used in the calculation. 21 has zero decimal places, 13.8 has one, 21 is our limiting term as it has zero decimal places. So our final answer is just gonna be seven. And the number that we discard is this two. Now two is less than five. And in our rounding rules, that means the preceding digit stays the same. And our final answer is just seven. Now that we've done a couple problems for significant figures, let's go ahead and move into our sixth objective which is about dimensional analysis. Now, it's often necessary to convert a given result from one system of units to another. And the best way to do this is by a method called the unit factor method, or more commonly, dimensional analysis. To illustrate the use of this method, we're going to consider several unit conversions. And conversion factors are really used to cancel unwanted units, and it can be extremely helpful to move from one unit to another. Now here are a couple that I would recommend we know here from the start. We're going to build on this as we do more general chemistry, but this is a good start. This will help you get some of the through some of the example problems we do in this lecture and through some of the example problems we'll do in the problem set that will follow this lecture. So one meter is equal to 1.094 yards. 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. One cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. This is going to be very important. One kilogram is equal to 2.205 pounds. 453.6 grams is equal to one pound. One mile is equal to 1760 yards or 5,280 feet. One liter is equal to 1.06 quart. One cubic feet is equal to 28.32 liters. One gallon is equal to four quarts. And one pound is equal to 16 inches. Now, 
how are we going to be able to do this dimensional analysis? I'm going to scroll past a couple of problems here just to talk about the steps and then we'll go back to that problem, that dimensional analysis problem and do it together. So how are we going to do this easy? We're going to follow these three steps every time we try to tackle a dimensional analysis problem. First, you want to do is write down what you want to know. What's the goal unit? And then you also want to write down what you were given in the problem. What is the given measured quantity you're starting off with. And so now you have what you're starting off with, what you want to get to. You can start to think about the different conversion factors that you want to do in order to cancel unwanted units. Now, the best way to really learn this is through a practice problem. So let's go ahead and do this one together. It says a Japanese car is advertised as having a gas mileage of 15 kilometers per liter convert this rating to miles per gallon. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to write what we know. We know that the mileage is 15 kilometers per liter. And our goal is to get this into units of miles per gallon. So what you notice here is we're going to convert the numerator from kilometers, kilometers to miles, and we're going to convert the denominator liter to gallon. So let's tackle each of these independently. So this is like two conversions that are going to happen here. So let's tackle each one separately. We want to go from kilometers to miles. The first thing that we could do, and there's various ways you can do this, by the way, but based off of what we've covered so far in our lesson, the logical thing to do based off of what you've learned so far is go from kilometers to meters. And this is easy because you're just using what you know about metric prefixes here. All right, you know that one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters. Then from meters, you can actually go to yards. This was one of the unit conversions we showed here. All right, we know that one meter is equal to 1.0994 yards. So we're gonna go ahead and write that conversion to remind ourselves. One meter is equal to 1.0994 yards, I'm sorry. And then, last but not least, we can actually go from yards to miles. This was another conversion we covered where we said that one mile is equal to 1,760 yards or 5,280 feet. Here we're concerned about the unit conversion of yards two miles. So we're going to write that one mile is equal to 1760 yards. So now we have devised a plan on how to go from kilometers to miles. And let me color this in pink to stay in theme. Beautiful. What about the second part that we need to do? Because we need to do another conversion. We need to go from liters all the way to gallons. How are we going to do that? Well, again, we're going to use some of the conversions we talked about. We can go from liters to quarts, for example. And we know that one liter is equal to 1.06 quarts. And we also have a conversion that we talked about that goes from quarts to gallons. One gallon is equal to four quarts. Beautiful. So again, we've also devised the plan for this second conversion. And now all we have to do for dimensional analysis is put it together so that we can complete the whole conversion. And the way that you want to place these conversions that we've talked about right here is in a matter where you're canceling out the units appropriately. So, for example, in our first conversion, focusing on kilometers, our first conversion is that one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. We're going to put kilometer here in the denominator so that the unit here and here cancel out. And we'll put 1,000 meters in the numerator. Then for our next conversion, which is that one meter equals 1.094 yards, we're going to put the, the meter in the denominator. So again, the meters cancel out. We'll put 1.094 yards in the numerator. And then for that last conversion, we want to go from yards to miles. We want to make sure yards cancels out. So we're going to put 1760 yards in the denominator. That way these cancel out and we put one mile in the numerator. Wonderful. And we have gotten mile in the numerator now, so we are good with that first conversion. Now we want to implement the conversions that are going to allow us to get from liter to gallon. So first conversion is to take liters and convert it to quarts. Here we're going to put liter in the numerator so it cancels out with the liter in the denominator here in the first value we started off with. And we'll put 
0.06 quarts here in the denominator. And then the last conversion, the last conversion is from quarts to gallons. We know that one quart, we're going to put that in the numerator so it cancels out, is equal to one gallon. And now the final units that are only left here is this miles right here and this gallon right here in the denominator. And so we will get a value with units that are miles over gallons here. Now for the actual value, you can go ahead and plug it into a calculator. And what you're going to get is about 35 miles per gallon. All right. And notice that 35 here. Two significant figures, what we started off, 15, two significant figures. So the results obtained that I'm writing here are done by rounding at the end of the calculation. So there it is, 35 miles per gallon. We were able to convert kilometers per liter to miles per gallon. Now we can go ahead and move into our objective for density. Density is a physical property that measures the amount of mass in a given volume of a substance. It is calculated by dividing the mass of an object by its volume. So here you see the equation that defines density. Now the SI unit for density is kilogram per cubic meter. That makes sense. The SI unit for mass we said was kilogram, and we talked about how volume is calculated. It's meters times meters times meter because the formula for volume is length times width times height. And so the SI unit for our density is kilograms per cubic meter. Now this is not to say that other units aren't used. So another common unit that is used to describe density is grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeters. And we're going to discuss when it comes time, how we convert between one unit to another if need be. Again, it just considers dimensional analysis, and we'll get more familiar with that with our practice problem set. Now, density is an important concept in chemistry because it helps us determine the behavior and characteristics of substances, and it can be used to identify and classify materials because substances with different densities often exhibit different physical properties. For example, oil floats on water because its density is lower than that of water. Now, understanding density allows scientists to predict how substances will interact with each other and with the environment. And it's particularly useful in fields like material science, geology, and engineering, where knowledge of density really comes at play in the design and analysis of various structures and materials. Now, the best way to understand density is to do an example problem. So that's exactly what we're going to do. This problem says a chemist trying to identify the main component of a compact disc cleaning fluid, finds that 25 cubic centimeters of the substance has a mass of 19.624 grams at 20 degrees Celsius. The following are the names and densities of the compounds that might be the main component. Which of these compounds is the most likely to be the main component of the compact disc cleaner? So, in order to identify the unknown substance, we're going to have to calculate the density and see which of these materials it aligns with so that we can determine the main component. This can be done just using the formula for density, which is mass over volume. We're given both those values. The mass is 19.625 grams, and the volume is 25 cubic centimeters. If we plug this into a calculator, we'll get 0 0.7. 850 grams per cubic centimeters. Now notice, this is really good. The units that we calculate from the values that were given match the units that our table are in. So we don't have to do any conversions to be able to start comparing this value with the values in the table. So just by doing a comparison, we notice that this number aligns with the density of isopropyl alcohol. This density corresponds exactly to that of isopropyl alcohol, and that means this is the most likely component of the cleaner. Now we can move on to talking about temperature. An integral concept in our explanation of thermodynamics is going to be temperature. But what exactly is temperature? In everyday language, we often use it to, the term temperature to convey the sensation of hotness or coldness. However, in the realm of thermodynamics, this is going to be a topic we cover in a lot of details here in General Chemistry 1. 
it possesses a more precise and profound significance. So at the molecular level, temperature correlates with the average kinetic energy of the constituent particles of a substance. And on a macroscopic scale, the temperature differential between two objects directs the flow of heat. Heat will spontaneously move from regions of higher temperature to those of lower temperature. But how does this knowledge actually translate to like the practical function of thermometers? Well, thermometers have been used to identify the temperature of substances since the 18th century, and some well-known uh, systems include Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin scales. Now, both Celsius and Fahrenheit are based on the phase changes of water, which makes them convenient for everyday use. The Celsius scale defines the freezing and boiling point of water as zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius respectively, while the Fahrenheit scale defines the freezing and boiling points of water to be 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degrees Fahrenheit respectively. The Kelvin scale, this is most commonly used for scientific measurement, and it's one of the seven SI base units. It defines as the zero reference point to be absolute zero. This is the theoretical temperature at which there is no thermal energy, and it sets the freezing point of water at 273 Kelvin. Now, it's going to be really important to be able to convert between the different units. So, if you know Fahrenheit, you can convert to Celsius using this equation. 5 over 9 multiplied by Fahrenheit minus 32 will give you Celsius. If you have Celsius and you want to get to Fahrenheit, you can do 9 over 5 multiplied by Celsius plus 32. And the way to get Kelvin is just to take the Celsius and add 273 to it. We're going to cover th uh, temperature in more details, of course, when we cover thermochemistry, but these equations are important to know in a, uh, preliminarily anyways. So. With that being said, that's all we're going to talk about temperature here. We're going to go ahead and move into our last and final objective, which is classification of matter. Matter is defined as anything occupying space and having mass. Matter exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas, technically four if you count plasma, but that's not going to be a topic of interest here in general chemistry one. Now, we can visualize these states of matter here. Solid, it holds shape and has fixed volume. Liquid takes the shape of the container, but it has a fixed volume. And gas takes the shape and the volume of the container. Now, matter is complex and it has many levels of organization. At the highest level, matter is categorized into two broad types, heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Heterogeneous mixtures are those in which the different components can be visually distinguished, and so they are not uniformly distributed throughout the mixture. Examples include things like salad, sandy water, or oil and vinegar dressing. In contrast, homogeneous mixtures are uniform in composition and the different components can't be easily separated by physical means. These mixtures are also known as solutions. So you can think of like salt dissolved in water or air. Moving deeply, uh, homogeneous mixtures are further classified as pure substances. Um, pure substances are forms of matter that have a constant composition and properties throughout. They can be elements or compounds. Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means, and they're made of only one type of atom, like just gold or just oxygen. Compounds, on the other hand, consist of two or more elements that are chemically bonded together, like water, H2O, or carbon dioxide, CO2. CO2. <laughs> At the atomic level, Elements are made up of atoms, and atoms are the smallest unit of an element that can retain its chemical properties. Atoms themselves consist of a nucleus surrounded by electrons. The nucleus contains protons and neutrons, and they are collectively known as nucleons. Electrons are negatively charged particles that orbit the nucleus and they're involved in chemical reactions and bonding. This is going to be the focus of next chapter, actually, so we're going to talk a lot more about atoms, but just to drill down to the subatomic level to really give you a feeling of how matter is 
so complex and it has so many levels of organization, protons and neutrons are actually composed of even smaller particles called quarks. And quarks are fundamental constituents of matters and they come in different types, up and down quarks, and they combine in specific ways to form the particles in the atomic nucleus. So these protons and neutrons, they're made out of quarks, they're also made out of gluons, which kind of keep the quarks glued together to form these protons and neutrons. Um, we're not going to get too much into that besides that, but subatomic structures of atoms are something that we're going to talk about in the next chapter, so definitely stay tuned. And I hope that this flow chart actually provides a clear visualization of the complexity of matter. With that being said, We've covered everything that we needed to in this first chapter titled Chemical Foundations. I really hope this was helpful to you. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.